Well, good morning. How is everyone doing? You doing good? That's good. Well, it was a few months ago that Pastor Jeff was asking some of us as on, who are on staff uh, who could help uh, during the summer while there were times, some, certain Sundays when he was going to be away. And I said, sure, I'd love to help. Just make sure it's not the Sunday after VBS. So instead, it's the Sunday before VBS. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes, see how my train of thought works. So, but I was very excited when I saw that I was going to get to be able to come up here this week and talk with you uh, through uh, the Romans road trip. And then I realized we were on Romans chapter 2, hypocrisy and self-deception. And I thought, that's not really the topic that kids ministers normally preach on when they show up in the great hall. So I'm excited about this morning because of just the preparation I've been seeing as far as what it's taught me, what I've been seeing in myself that I feel like the Lord is trying to remove from me. And so my prayer for you this morning is that as we look at Romans 2, you don't sit there and go, man, I'm awful, I'm terrible, I'm horrible. But instead you see that there is redemption, there is grace for where we are. And so as we think about that, I just want to remind us, again, Romans 3.23, we've been working on it. But next week is Romans 6.23. I want to go ahead and give you a heads up. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that's the verse we're going to work on starting next week. So when Jeff gets back up here next week and he starts to say it, if you can already know it, it'd really help me out a lot. I'd really appreciate that. I like to get brownie points. That's kind of my thing on staff here. Um, just kidding. So last week we talked about Romans 1. We talked about it as this, Ro- as this Romans road trip idea, right? We, we always go on a road trip as a family in the summer times, as opposed to during, during the school year. School teachers kind of frown on that. So you can kind of get the the road trip happening in the summertime. And we talked last week about Romans 1 kind of being this idea of sin city, right? And how we look at, there's kind of three things I wrote down from last week. You have God's righteousness. But then as you look at God's righteousness, you see our rejection. But then praise God that God has a response. And that sometimes his response is to let us continue down the path we've chosen but then ultimately he wants to provide us with a rescuer. And so as we dive into Romans chapter two this morning, I kind of want you to imagine with me. So my wife just finished up law school back in May. And so we did, we did a little vacation before the kids got out of school. So we, we packed up our car. We got a bunch of stuff packed up in there. We got our, our swim trunks and all that sort of thing or whatever swim stuff girls wear. I can't think what it's called right now because I'm in sermon mode. And so we got our bags packed. We got all the stuff in the car we were going to do for our road trip. And we got it gassed up and got the, all the way to the, the tank on full. And we headed out and we drove all the way to Plano. <laughs> that's not really a road trip, right? That's, that's the suburbs. And really kind of what we see in Romans chapter 2 is that we don't get very far out of Sin City. We don't get very far out of that place. We really kind of get to the suburbs of Sin City where we look at what we're calling this week the twin cities, hypocrisy and self-deception. Thank goodness our road trip wasn't just a Plano, not a knock on Plano. So if you live in Plano, trust me, it's okay. But thankfully, we actually got to hop on a plane, go kind of take a little vacation, some time away. It was truly getting away, right? We had to get out of the place we were for it to be a vacation, we, you know, or else you call it the, the staycation, right? It's not a vacation if you stay where you are. And so what as we look at, at Romans 2 this morning, my prayer for us is that we realize that we have to get even outside of the suburbs of Sin City, that the Twin Cities are not a place for us to stop, to settle, to, make, to, to camp out, to buy a home. This is a place we need to drive through and get out of. And so really kind of the question I want us to kind of wrestle with this morning The question I hope that you kind of think through is this. What if we are just religious enough to make ourselves sleep better at night? As Travis and I were talking through it this week and talking about Romans 2, that was a question that he threw out that I thought, that's such a great description of this chapter. What if we are just religious enough so that it helps us to sleep better at night? And that's it. And so my prayer is that as we look at this passage this morning, we, we fight that tendency, we fight that temptation for it to just be about us 
being able to just to get a good night's sleep. I did enough good things that I, now I can go to sleep. Because really, I think, if we we're honest, the deeper you get into following Jesus, sometimes the harder it is to sleep at night, the things you're praying for, the things that are on your mind, the things that concern you, the things that you want to bring before the Lord, the people that you meet, the conversations you are having continuously. But that's the question I hope that we wrestle with a little bit this morning. What if we are just religious enough to make ourselves sleep better at night? And so here's how we're going to kind of walk through Romans 2. I'm going to read a little bit, and then we'll talk through it, and we'll kind of just piece our way through. There was a part of me that thought about just reading the entire chapter in one sitting, but I'm not going to do that to you. That's just mean. That's like you know, what a professor does or something like that when you go to you know, that class you don't want to go to. So we're going to kind of look at it piece by piece. So as we start, we start with verses 1 through 3, where we settle in hypocrisy. The first of our twin cities, the city of hypocrisy. And Paul says sometimes we settle in hypocrisy. And here's what he says. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Paul comes out swinging in Romans chapter 2, right? He, he finished strong in chapter 1. He keeps on going. If you're, if you're new to church, normally if you were to have gotten this, this letter from Paul at your church there in Rome, it wouldn't have been broken down into chapters and verses. Really, it's just kind of, it's one continuous thought. And then later we came and kind of broke it down so it's easier to find things and whatnot. As I look at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, I, I think about this. I can't judge people ob objectively because of my own sin. My own sin gets in my way of being able to be the judge and to judge other people effectively. I can't do it. My sin limits me from that. Because what's interesting is that I tend to be harder on the person whose sin is like my own. Right? So like I, one of the things that I struggle with, I struggle with anger. And if I'm not careful, that can come out of me in a way that is sinful and wrong. Well, I'm much harder on people who can't control their anger and who take it, what I would call, a step further, right? I'm so much harder on them. Or, or you think about if, if you struggle with lust, and, I ask, and, and I'm looking at that, and, I'm, and I watch someone who has an affair, and they cheat on their spouse, I'm harder on that person than, than I should be. It's, it's almost like because of my own sin, it, it's opposite. You'd think I would show that person more grace, but instead I want to be quick to the point to be the judge to be the one to call out the sin. Let's look at why that is. I think it's because hypocrisy and judging others, it, it leads us to categorizing sin. Right? Jesus talks about, you know, you, you want to call out the speck in this person's eye, but yet you have a plank in your own. He talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. You see, I, I, want, to, I want to start categorizing my sin and say, well, well, yeah, I thought it, but I didn't act on it. And Jesus says, they're the same. If you have murder in your heart because you hate someone and you're angry with them, it's the same as if you murder them. Now, obviously, in our day and age, there's going to be a difference as far as our earthly consequence, right? I'm not going to jail for life because I was mad at someone and I have hate for them in my heart. We, we experience different earthly consequences. And so I think because of those earthly consequences, it leads us to think that we can start to categorize our sin as well. And Jesus says you cannot categorize it. Sin is sin. And because of my sin, I cannot judge that person objectively. My own sin gets in the way of that. And we want God's grace so many times based on how we compare ourselves to others. But what's interesting, whenever we start to compare ourselves to others, it's always people that are lower than us, right? 
Like if I'm going to compare myself, if I want God to give me grace based on how I compare to someone else, I'm not going to pick Billy Graham. Let's just be honest, right? That's not going to be my comparison. That's not the point I'm starting at. I'm going like Stalin, right? Hitler. Like I'm going low. I'm going as far deep on that bar as I can get. Why? Because we want to, we want to compare ourselves. We want to categorize the sin. And it's always, when we compare ourselves, it's always people who are lower than us. People who we think are worse off. We can't judge people objectively. Our own sin gets in the way. But praise God that he can. Praise God that he can judge people objectively. Verse 11 says, For God shows no partiality. Whether you're Jew or you're Greek, or for us Gentiles, right? Those of us who are not Jewish, we would be called Gentiles. You know, praise God that he shows no partiality that he is a fair judge, that he is a righteous judge. But one of the things that we see is because he's that judge, we need a hero. And we're going to see that theme continue. So not only do we settle in hypocrisy, but Paul also says we stay in self-deception. I'm going to come back to verse 4 in a little bit, but let's jump down to verse 12. All right? We stay in self-deception. We, we desire to be the hero. We, we want to come in and, and be the hero in that moment. Right? I, I heard it once called a Messiah complex. Right? I want to come in. I want to be the Messiah. I want to come in and be the knight on shining armor. armor. Oh, that was East Texas. Wow. You know, riding on my white horse. I'm going to save the day. You know, ladies, you, know, you want to be Captain Marvel. You want to be the hero in the story. And God says, we're not the hero. But yet we want to be. I think about when I was living in Houston. We were there uh, before we lived here, and we were on staff down there at a church. And we get the call there in the office one day that one of our uh, MDO moms, she had dropped off her kid at church for, for Mother's Day out, and she left, and she had a flat tire. So me and our discipleship pastor, we decided that we were going to go change her tire. We'd go, we were going to go drive her where she was. She's about five, ten minutes away from the church. We get over there, and... They've used like the best hydraulic drill known to mankind to get these, these, these bolts on, right? And so I'm sitting there going, good night, this is ridiculous. So me and, and this other pastor, we're trying to get this thing free. And I finally just go, I'm thinking this in my head. He's like 50 something, like he's up there, you know, I'm all cocky, you know, or, or, if, or if he's podcasting this later, he's 60 something, 70 something, right? I'm like, I got at least 20 years on this guy. So, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, kind of puff up my chest, you know, at the time, you know, you know, young 31, 32 year old, you know, and I just decided I'm just going to pop this thing off. I'm just going to do it right now and just kind of have this kind of like, <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of moment. I've already kind of, I'm already picturing how it's going to look in my mind. And so sure enough, there is a pop like none other. It has nothing to do with the tire and everything to do with my back. <laughs> and I throw my back out in this moment, and I'm stuck. And I'm just frozen going, I've never had this happen before. I don't know what to do. And so I'm like, Darren, what do I do? And he's like, just slowly stand up. So he and the MDO mom slowly help me <laughs> back over to his car. They help me get into the car. I'm, it's very painful. I finally sit down. And from the car, I watch as he and this MDO mom eventually, they can't get it, so they finally just call AAA. I wanted to be the hero so bad, and yet I failed so bad, right? And like, I could not look at this lady for like a month. It was, it was embarrassing, right? I'm on the couch for like three days. That's where you learn, you know, only ice it, don't heat it, all that fun stuff. I wanted to be the hero. I had that desire to be the hero, and in that moment, I realized I didn't have what it took. They needed an actual tool to get this off, right? They needed, they needed the arms of Thor, right? They needed his hammer to break that thing off because of how tightly wound it was. We desire to be the hero. And so Paul kind of lays out why that can't happen here in the second half of the chapter, Verse 12 and 13 say this, For all who have sinned without the law 
will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, when Paul's talking about the law, he knows what he's talking about. The law is found in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, right? And Paul was a Pharisee. So as a Pharisee, he had to memorize the first five books. He had the law memorized, right? He had numbers memorized. Like, it's hard enough for me just to walk through it earlier this year as we were doing the read through the Bible. But he had that thing memorized. So when he talks about the law, he knows exactly what he's talking about here. He's talking about the law that's 613 laws, to be specific. Now, we know the first 10 is the Ten Commandments. And if we're lucky, we might can get all 10, right? In this room, in a room this size, I think we might could get all 10. But then you've got 603 more. So Paul is saying, basically, God gave the law to the Israelites really kind of for two reasons. Um, and there's, there's actually more than this, but I really kind of want to focus on two reasons. God gave the law to separate the Israelites from the other nations. It was so that the other nations would look at the country of Israel and how they interact with each other, how they they worked morally, how they worked as a society and go, y'all are different. That's right, the other nations said y'all. You didn't know that, but they did. (laughs) They said, y'all are different. There's something different about about this country of Israel Because ultimately, the law was supposed to point the other nations to Israel, so they would then point them to God. It was to show the other nations that they were missing something. But also, the law was so that the Israelites, his people, would realize that they cannot achieve God's perfect standard. You can't keep all 613. You can't do it. And so they would constantly be bringing in animal after animal to be sacrificed for this and for that. And God was constantly reminding them, you need a hero. There is a hero needed, and it's going to be bigger than the law. It was ultimately pointing us to Jesus. Spoiler. So verse 12 and 13, we need a hero. And really, Paul kind of looks at two different people groups that he wants to point out that they need that hero. Verse 14 through 16 I would, I would call this the, the spiritual but not religious, right? Jeff talked about this some last week. Um, it's this idea of, of you do you. You achieve happiness however it is that you want to achieve it. Don't let us stand in your way. If you're, if you're passionate about it, man, go for it. Go, go do that, right? This is kind of, this kind of you do you. I almost threw out a you go girl, but I didn't, thankfully. So here's what it says. Here's what Paul says. In verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work, sorry, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. They wanted to achieve happiness through their own definition. Right? It's, 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 it's continuing that theme from chapter one that Jeff talked about last week, that, that they had these desires, and so God finally just said, okay, that's your choice. If that's your choice, then, then, then I, I, I give you up to those. But also, the, one, thing, one of the things that we see about, about the people today that are spiritual but not religious, which... Studies say that it's one of the fastest growing religions in our country, this idea of I'm spiritual but not religious. I think Jeff has said that it's about 20 to 25% of our country falls in this category. It's the fastest growing religion we have. They don't like organized religions of our day. Like what we talked about last week, true covenant, community, accountability, what we strive for here within these four walls of our church, we, we want people to understand that this is a covenant you are making to be a part of a relationship with God. One that we ultimately can't keep. God keeps it for us. But we have, this, this, we have a calling to be a part of a true covenant, to have accountability, to connect on a deep level, to not just be surface level, but to go deep with people, 
and to open up and to be honest and to experience true community. Ultimately, they say, the spiritual but not religious group would say, I, I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of the traditional church. And they don't realize what they're missing. They believe that there's something bigger and better, but it's not found in church. They believe that there's a higher calling, there's a moral being, right? As Phoebe Buffet would say, the, the universe around us. Right? They believe there's, there is something bigger, but it's not found in an organized religion. If you notice in that passage, Paul even says they do parts of the law. Chances are you know these people. They're good people. They have great moral decision-making that they can do. They're not awful people. They, they can be good people. They're kind. They're hospitable. They give of their time. They want to see change happen in our city. But ultimately, Scripture says they're condemned. Just because they're good people doesn't mean that they can be their own hero. They still end up being condemned. And so we think naturally, well, let's just get them inside the church. If we, if we can just get them inside the church, then, then they're good. And Paul says, no. There's also a problem there as well. This is verse 17 through 22. And here's what Paul says about those of us inside the church. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law and you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, amen, having the law embodied of knowledge and truth, then you who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? Good answer. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? And what Paul is basically saying is, it goes back to hypocrisy, right? Hypocrisy, self-deception. They're the twin cities because they can be so interchangeable. And I would say that we could call this group today the, the religious but not spiritual. Right? The first part was that, that spiritual, but not religious. This time you can flip it and say, it's, this one's the, more like the, the religious, but not spiritual. At our church, we use a phrase that, that is in our society called the cultural Christian. Right? Paul, in chapter 2 right here, is talking about our mission statement, that we are to rescue one another from cultural Christianity so that they will follow Jesus every day. They need a rescuer. Paul is saying this, this people group right here, it's all about the works. They need a rescuer. The people today who are religious but not spiritual, they, they do the church thing really well, right? Like this next week, they'll be here serving at VBS because it's a need. They need to serve. They got to serve. They got to do it. They'll, they'll tithe well. They might, even, they might not even have to do what I do and do the recurring auto draft so you don't forget that it's the 15th of the month, right? That, oh, it's the 15th. I got to give my check. I got to do it. Right? They might even sit in on a committee that we have. They might serve at one of our different ministry sites that we, that we partner with around our city or around the world. But Paul would say that they do the church thing, but it's not enough to be their own hero. And if I'm honest with you, this is my tendency as well. This is my temptation. And my fear for myself is the same as my fear for, for you. My fear for myself is that I'm going to get so good at doing my job that I'm going to miss my relationship with Jesus. And it's going to become so much about, did that event go well? Do we have a lot of people show up? Did it run smooth? Did a kid cry? No. All right. It's a success. It's a win, right? And yes, if a kid doesn't cry, it is a win, but I can start to define myself based on how I do my job rather than the fact that I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a son of God. And that is my ultimate definition. That's my ultimate goal. And that should be the ultimate thing that I think about day in and day out. Yet the temptation is so easy to say, as long as my works look good, then I'm good. As long as I'm doing all the right things, 
and the self-deception that I think of is real, then I'm okay. And Paul says no. Paul says we fall short of the perfect standard of the commandments that he uses as an example. We fall short of that. I think about uh, earlier this week, I was driving a couple of our boys up here for uh, one of our sport camps that they were doing. And we were right on time, maybe going to be a few minutes late, but it wasn't bad. So we were, we were driving along um, and I needed to get over. So I sped up and I got over in front of a car so that I could turn left, right? They don't like it when you turn left from the center lane. It's weird. So I had to get over. And so all of a sudden I hear Corbin, our oldest from the back seat, go, Dad, were we speeding? And I go, no, but we're fine. He goes, but I felt like we went fast. Were we speeding? And I said, well, start to justify. I needed to get over so that I could turn. And I was, and really I was just trying to help with the flow of traffic, make sure that we were still good. You always, you always use the flow of traffic line, right? It's so easy. Because they don't know. It just sounds good. Just, so I was like, flow of traffic. I didn't really want to mess that up. And so I was like, but could you have gotten a ticket? I said, no, most, most cops, and this is where I'm, I'm starting to just kind of mix stuff up. Most cops are, they're okay with that because it helps with the flow of traffic. And every now and then you'll find a cop that's like really hard and stickler. And, but mo- no, I'm good. Oh, so we were speeding? <laughs> yeah, Corbin. Yeah, but I, I was speeding. And then we went to the conversation of, no, no, I wouldn't go to jail. Where it's okay. I would have given a ticket. And, you know, I'll, and you went, how many tickets? You're not old enough. <laughs> you know, right? Like when, once your age is equal to the number of tickets I've got, then we'll have that conversation. So, but I was I was okay, but Corbin called me on it. Technically, I was speeding. I was wrong. And Paul says, "Look at these questions I'm asking you." You might sit there and go, "Paul, you're getting kind of nitpicky there." Like, come on and. But Paul's pointing out the fact that technically, right, it's still a sin. Sin is sin. There's no categories of sin in God's eyes. Sin is sin. And once we have fallen into sin, we can't get out on our own. And Paul reminds us we need a rescuer. My fear today is that there's people in this room that are like this as well. That you would say, As long as I'm here at church, I'm good. As long as I'm doing all the right things, I'm good. You know, it's it's about church attendance, or it's a you know, I was baptized, so one you know, I got baptized. And Paul would say, No. Those are outward acts. And Paul's saying, I'm looking at the heart. Jesus would even say, that person is a whitewashed tomb, right? That's what he talked about with the Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees, that's, that, that, that's us. It's people who are, we're religious people. We get it. We know, that we know right from wrong. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside. You're doing great. You look fantastic. Inside, there's no life. There's no life inside of you. There's no relationship with me inside of you. And my fear today is that that there are people here who think that as long as they look good on the outside and they do the church thing, they're okay. And Paul would say, no, you're not. And my prayer is that you don't hear me and start to feel down on yourself, but instead you would say, okay, so there's something more. There's something else that I need to be approaching life with. And Paul would say, yes. And before he gets there, he also takes one more shot at us as the church, which is fun, right? We always like that. feels good. So verse 23 and 24, Paul says this, you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law, right? Those things he talked about. And here's verse 24. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The, the word Gentile there. Uh, it's, it's the Greek word for, for nations, right? Which is interesting because what Paul was talking about earlier with the law was so that the other nations 
would look at Israel and be pointed to God. Yet Paul uses that same word and says, the nations, yeah, they're blaspheming God because of you. And so I really wrestled with that this week. And ultimately what I kind of landed on was this. What if we were to seek out the neighbor here in our city who doesn't look like us or vote like us or walk where we walk or do what we do? What if we were to really seek them out? And the reason that this came to me is because another, another flat tire story, ironically. Um, there's a theme apparently with my life. So last week, end of, end of last week, or two weeks ago, uh, we got a flat tire on the van. Because of timing, we just we couldn't get it changed in time. And so we were trying to figure out, okay, so we can get this kid to this appointment for this and this kid over here. And I finally just said, you know what? On vacation, we took mass transit, right? We did mass transportation. I, I'm going to do that. I'm going I'm to go down to, to work on Thursday only by the DART system. And that's the only way I'm going to get there except for if, if y'all could drop me off at the DART station so I don't have to walk, that'd be great. So they obliged, right? Drop me off at the DART station, right? I hop on the, the DART rail, ride down, hop on a bus, ride over. It was actually pretty easy. It was, it was kind of nice, didn't have to deal with traffic. Um, but what was interesting is as I was taking that route, route, tomato, tomato, as I was taking that path, there were people on those modes of transportation that I don't really come in contact with that often. I saw a completely different part of our city. And when I got here, I started thinking, maybe the next time I do that because I want to, not because I need to. Maybe that should be something I start working into my weekly routine. At some point, during my week, I, I go a different route. Even if it's driving my own car. But I was sitting there going, that's going to that's gonna help me seek out those in my city who aren't like me, who don't look like me. And I kind of ask this question. And I hope you hear the way that I'm asking this. Do we listen and watch the news with our political glasses on first? Or is it through our Christ-following lens first? Right? I heard a pastor talk once about the, the, dual, the dual passport that we wrestle with. We have our earthly citizenship, but then we also have a heavenly citizenship. And we have this dual passport obligation that we, that we have to wrestle with as believers and followers of Jesus. And I started thinking about myself and how quickly I am to watch the news politically versus watching the news and the, the stories of our day as a Christ follower. And so I started doing that some. Nicole was kind of talking through this with me a little bit, even kind of helping me with this a few weeks ago. And it really kind of changes how you watch the news. It changes the way that you want to pray for our city. It changes the way that you want to pray for our country. And so, but by no means am I talking about how we vote today or anything like that. That's not my job. That's not my job to, to go into that area of life. I'm talking about how we respond to people around us with the gospel. That's people who need to know Jesus. People who should be followers of Jesus. Now look at kind of the, the climate of our day. And I think, how do we as a church keep from falling into verse 24? How do we as a church make sure that what we are doing does not cause people around us to want to blaspheme God? And so I started thinking about the group that just went down to El Paso on a mission trip to serve those at the border. Right? That wasn't a political trip. It was a, it was a trip because we said there are people there that need to know that Jesus loves them. God has brought them to our borders. No matter how we vote, we need to go make sure that they know about the gospel. Let's go tell them. I think about for the nations, right? It's a, it's a refugee ministry that was birthed out of, out of uh, people from this church. It's, it's, the, it's where our offering is going for VBS this next week because we're going we're gonna to build them a playground. 
They have an after-school program for kids. We want those kids to know that Jesus loves them. We want to make sure that when people hear the name of God, when they hear the name of Jesus, or even more locally, when they hear the name Park Cities Baptist Church, my hope is that their first thought isn't, oh yeah, they stand for such and such. Oh yeah, they're, they're against such and such. Oh yeah, they're for such and such. My hope is that when they hear the name Park Cities Baptist Church, they go, oh yeah, those are people who love Jesus. And they want people around them to know Jesus. And they don't care who you are. They don't care what you look like. They don't care how you act. They don't care where you are in your, in your lifestyle, lifespan. Their goal is to make sure that you know that God loves them. And they're going to love you well. And they're going to encourage you. And they're going to talk about truth but they're also going to talk about grace and they're going to use it interchangeably and show that, that, that both are required. And all of a sudden, the conversation starts to sound a little bit different. And sometimes it makes it hard to sleep at night because you start wrestling with things that are going on in our city and in our nation and you realize, God, we still need a hero. And it's not going to be a political color, but it's going to be through the throne and and through the saving grace of Jesus. And so Paul, as we're in this drive through the suburbs of hypocrisy and self-deception, he asks a very important question back in in verse 4. This is kind of where I want to land. Verse 4 and verse 29. It says this. It says, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. And the question I kind of wrote down is this, do I take advantage of God's kindness or do I allow it to lead me to repentance? Do we take advantage of God's kindness and say, it's okay because he's going to give me grace for that. It's okay, I can be forgiven for that. Or does it change us to want to repent and say, God, never again, I want to go that way. Never again do I want to go down that path. God, I want to repent, right? The word repent basically means we're going one way and we completely turn the opposite and start going back towards Jesus. Instead of walking away from him, we're walking towards him. It's not saying, God, please forgive me. God, please forgive me, right? That's not repentance. That's trying to get permission. And God says, I want repentance, And the fact that I haven't smited you yet, my hope is that leads you to repentance, right? My kindness, my forbearance is not so that you keep being hypocritical and keep having this struggle with self-deception, but ultimately I want it to point you to me because God says, I'm the hero. Verse 29, this is where we land. But a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Paul shows us our hero, and it's found in heart transformation, only capable through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about being spiritual and doing what we want to do, but still having some sort of moral identity. It's not about how many times can I get to church in a month? How how many mission trips can I go on? Right, those are good things, but ultimately God says those things happen with, with the overflow of the heart. Right? Those who are followers of Jesus, it's, we can't help but show up and serve and make sure kids know how to follow Jesus too. We can't help but go on a mission trip and make sure that these people know that God loves them. It's out of an overflow of the heart. It's not obligation. It's out of joy. And so my prayer for you today is this. If you define yourself as spiritual, my prayer is give the church a chance. Jesus calls us his bride. Jesus says this church has value, capital C church. So therefore, this church, Park City's Baptist Church, has value in Jesus' eyes. Does it make us perfect? No. I'm on staff, so therefore we're not perfect, right? You're here, so therefore we're not perfect, but we're redeemed. If you are a religious person and you feel like coming to church is how God is okay with what you, how you act and God will be happier on the days when you show up at church versus not, 
That's not a relationship with Jesus. Scripture says God wants to save you. God wants to be your hero. You can't be your own. It's not about church attendance, how much you tithe, right? It's not about any of those things. Those things happen with an overflow because we've been saved by faith through Jesus. But ultimately, church, my hope is this. That as we leave out from here today and we go and we be the church this week, wherever we find ourselves, whether here for VBS or at work or wherever you find yourself this week, think about verse 24. Do your actions lead people to the gospel? The conversations that you'll have with people this week, will it point them to the gospel? Will it point them to Jesus? My hope is yes. My hope is that it's something that you wrestle with because it's worth wrestling over. It's worth getting right. And so as we think about our need for a hero and our need for a savior, we're going to respond in worship. We're going to respond with a song saying that, God, we need you. We need you. And if you feel like you don't need him, then you don't know him yet. And my prayer is that you will know him today, that you will sense that you need him today. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.